diseases that is extremely contagious and um, can spread to hives really easily. You basically yeah, she does tend to do that. You always want to kind of hold it over the hive in case she falls off. She'll fall back into the hive. Oh, the queen, yeah. Okay. Cool. Did you, oh, there she is. Oh, there. And uh, the male, when the Babylonians got married, the male had to drink mead every day for one moon or one month after marriage so they could have a male child. Honeymoon, honey wine. That's where that came from. When you're pulling out a brood frame, like I said, you want to look for all life stages. The eggs are tiny. There should be on the very bottom of the honeycomb cell, standing upright. They look like minuscule grains of rice. So you might have to try to hit the sun right and tilt the frame to see them. But typically on the frame, the queen is going to lay in the center. So in a healthy hive, you'll see a bunch of capped brood surrounded by larva, surrounded by eggs, and then pollen, because they put the pollen for the baby food near the larva, and then sometimes a little bit of honey in the corners. So you get this nice circular pattern of all the different life stages. A healthy queen will fill the frame as much as she possibly can with eggs and larva. So when you're looking to see how healthy your hive is, you should have multiple frames in the brood box full of eggs, larva, or pupa. Um, if you see a really spotty pattern, like some capped brood over here and some capped brood over there, but no eggs or larva in between, you know something's wrong. Maybe there's a disease in that. That's when you kind of dive in and look, okay, well, what's causing this, right? So the first question when doing an inspection is, are you queen right? Do you have a queen? If you see eggs, chances are you have a queen because she's been there in the last three days, right? So as a beekeeper, you want to disturb your bees as little as possible. So on my typical day, if I'm looking at, we have about 70 hives right now, and I don't have time to do a full inspection on each of them, if I see eggs, I put it back and I move to the next one because I know it's queen right. As long as the brood pattern looks good. How often should a person check them? Um, we check our hives once per week. Um, especially at this time, with the nectar starting to flow, you want to make sure they have enough room to make honey. How about have to buy another super, the big ones? Just Are you sure. still in the nuke box? No. Or, no, you're in the box. No, I got one, one big super and one small one. Eh? Yeah, you're going to need more. So I need more. <laughs> yeah. Now, a strong hive. You probably nukes on their first year won't make this much, but a strong hive can make 100 pounds of honey in a year. Wow. Yeah. yeah, like we average between 80 and 100 pounds of honey per hive. It's pretty cool. Um, the second question. So if you're queen right, if you have queens, you want to look at the brood pattern like we discussed, that nice circular pattern covering the whole frame. If it's diseased, some of the things we want to look for is do the larva look healthy and consistent in shape? So if they're all these perfect little wiggly wormies that are white and shiny in little semicircles, got nothing to worry about. If they look puddly or brown or yellow or dried looking, we have something wrong. Could be a disease like chalk brood or um, American fowl brood, which is really bad. We don't want that. American fowl brood is one of those diseases that is extremely contagious and um, can spread to hives really easily. You basically have to sanitize all your equipment and burn the hive if it's got American fowl brood to prevent it from spreading to other hives. It's really bad. So American fowl uh, disease came from the birds itself? Or where did they get it from? Oh no, it's, the reason it's called American fowl brood is because it's it's the U.S. variety, basically the American's variety, and it's foul because it makes the hive stink. Like it smells like rotting fish. And is that only here in North America or it's all over? Um, it's all over because of the spread of bees. You can order bees from almost anywhere, but typically it's just in 
um, North America. They have what's called European fowl brood in Europe, but that has spread to Alberta too. And last year there was a big European fowl brood outbreak, but it's, it's not so bad. That one is treatable and usually they take care of themselves. So they treat themselves by us? With the propolis, yeah. Okay. And they remove a lot of the dead or contaminated bees. Bees are really clean, so mm -hmm. they clean the hive really well. And the, the, by means of, uh, once you detect that, do you remove the entire, uh, uh, what do you call this, frame or what? So if I only see a couple larvae that don't look quite right, I'll usually leave it to see if they clean it up themselves. But if I have a whole hive that's really weak and it's obvious that it's overrun with American fowl brood, you have to burn everything, including the bees. You cannot reuse the equipment because it will just, the bacteria will spread on the equipment and live on the equipment. It's done. It's really upsetting. So it's very important when you're keeping bees or starting to keep bees that you know where they're coming from. You know, it's a reputable source, like the worker in hive is really good, and that they treat and make sure that they're not spreading diseases. It's always... So is this like a virus or is it a mice? It's a bacteria. It's a bacteria, so it's nothing you can spray or... Oh, for the American fowl group? No. It's basically really bad. There are other diseases, like the bee mites. They're almost like little ticks for yeah, bees. That's the one that I saw, some pictures of it. There yeah. And you can actually see the mite on the bee. You can see them. Um, I don't think we have any right now. They're pretty common. But if there's only a few of them, they're treatable to remove. You treat them with like an antibiotic, basically, like an anti-tick medication. Do you spray it? Um, it depends. There's multiple different types of treatments. We use strips. So it's a strip that is uh, coated in this medication, and when they walk over it, they get treated. Oh. And then we can remove it. It's easy to remove after the treatment period. So they just fall off their body or what? Yeah. So the ticks basically get poisoned and die. And then they oh, fall okay. off and fall to the bottom of the hive where the bees remove them. Yeah. So the bee mites are not such a bad problem. If you let them get out of control, they can weaken and kill your hive. But, um, but yeah, treatment is really easy for those guys. There's also what's called nozema, which is um, a fungus. Nozema and chalk crude. Um, and that isn't great for the bees either, but they usually take care of it themselves as well. Chalk brood, we would have seen maybe two weeks ago usually. After the winter, the queen is kind of stressed, the hive is stressed. Sometimes there's cold spots and warm spots and they're not super happy. So this fungus kind of takes over because they're not cleaning very well. And you'll see these little like mummified larvae in little white casings all at the bottom of the hive. And it just means there's stress in the hive. Most of the time, the bees will rectify that as long as you're giving them good conditions. So it's not something to watch out for, but we'll take a look for that on the bottom of our hive. We'll look for the little chalk brood mummies of the larva. Thank you. Uh, if, you if you don't mind, I mean, your jeans will protect you. We're uh, providing bee habitat. So with native pollinators and the destruction of habitat and increased use of pesticides, insecticides and herbicides, populations have been dwindling as I'm sure you've heard and the pollinators are super important to us and our ecosystem. So what you can do is plant native species. It's easy, native flowering species. Um, they don't have to be native, but you know that the bees are going to like them because they evolved together, right? Um, we also recommend planting in clumps because it's very dangerous and labor intensive for the bees to go out and forage. So if you plant in large groups, the bees have a, a nice nectar and pollen source all together, easy to find and easy to go from flower to flower. Um, so this here is buckwheat. What is this? Buckwheat. Now buckwheat uh, is super interesting because they're these little tiny white flowers but the honey they produce is almost like molasses. It's really dark, really rich. 
and a honeybee will only ever go to one type of flower on that cord. So if it goes to alfalfa first, it will only go to other alfalfa, and then it will go home, deliver the pollen or the nectar, and then come back out. So when you place hives in, let's say, a buckwheat field or a field of clover or canola, you're going to get that type of honey because the bees are very efficient little creatures and they'll only go as far as they need to, right? So whatever nectar source they're picking up from is going to flavor and color the honey. So it's very different compared to like a clover alfalfa. As a beekeeper, you always want to stop and look and listen. If you're this far away from your hive and you hear a big, loud, angry hum, you know something is probably wrong. If you see a hive and there's nobody coming in and out, something is probably wrong, especially on a day like today. Like they should be going in and out, right? You also want to look for animal signs. Skunks will scratch the front of your hive, the entrance area, so that the bees come out and then they swap them down and eat them. So it's not great for the hives. So you want to look for any signs of animals trying to get into the hives as well. And so drones look like a big fly, yeah? Yeah, like a big black fly with big, huge glistening eyes. You see how the worker bees, they have two little eyes and then kind of hair and antenna on the top of their head. A drone will have their eyes touching in the center of their head. Is she laying? Where did she go? She got around the bottom, maybe? Yeah, she does tend to do that. You always want to kind of hold it over the hive in case she falls off. She'll fall back into the hive. Oh, the queen, yeah. Okay. Cool. Did you, oh, there she is. Oh, there. Now, did you guys see queen cups in this one? Uh, yes, yeah. it's over there, like three of them. I think. So, in my mind, this lady, she's running out of room. Yeah. They need to move up. Cool. Years later, I'm still working on this, and it's not easy. Uh, made beer, made wine, it's okay. It's pretty straightforward. But need, there's nobody out there to tell you how to do it. And there's books. If you've got to read between the lines. And three, uh, over three years later, I finally figured it out and how to do it right and so on. Uh, it's very simple, honey, water, yeast. And it's been around since 7,000 BC, the figure in China. And then from there, it went to the Babylonians. And uh, the male, when the Babylonians got married, the male had to drink mead every day for one moon or one month after marriage so they could have a male child. Honeymoon, honey wine, that's where that came from. Then the, the Vikings got into it. So when the Vikings got into it, they uh, would pillage Europe and so on. And uh, then they would, there's lots of DNA flying around from the Vikings all over Europe. So guess who started making mead? English and whatever. They all made meat. And all of a sudden, it disappeared. Why? Because moonshine is a lot easier to make than, than, than meat is. Uh, or basically, refined sugar came along. And to make alcohol with refined sugar is quite easy compared to making it with honey. Because honey is at four co complex sugars, and those sugars are very hard to break down and make uh, alcohol. So we have to do some, we have to help them out by feeding them nutrients and we have to control our alcohol content. And those two little things right there can really screw up your day if you don't do it well. And it took me a long while to figure that out. Anyway, uh, now that uh, 2008, we opened the meadery, and uh, it's about almost half of our business in most cases. We're in liquor stores and so on. So I'll give you an idea what, uh, how you make it. It's about a two-month process. Uh, we mix up the honey and water, 
We do a 12 hour, six hour culture on the yeast. We put the yeast in, and it usually takes about uh, uh, two months from zero to bottle to get it in the bottle. And then, of course, we need to age it because we don't pasteurize the honey, and pure honey is a preservative. But therefore, we don't need to use sulfites, and it will age longer and better. So, 15 years is not uncommon to have a bottle of meat stored away. Uh, actually, our store manager, we just put a, a new one up. We hadn't released for 10 years because I couldn't find a certain kind of honey to make meat with. We finally found that honey. We, we reintroduced this uh, Excalibur meat, and my store manager had saved some from 10 years ago. And we took a bottle of hers and a bottle of the new stuff and compared them. And uh, you could tell they're both the same, except the one that was 10 years older was way more mellow. And it's just beautiful. That's what can happen to the meat over the years. So a traditional meat is honey, water, yeast. And that can change with the kind of honey, uh, how much honey, uh, the different kinds of yeast we have to use to give them different noses and so on. And to get those all together, and you're going to make a certain mead, you've got to use that certain yeast for it and so on. It took a lot of time to get that all straightened out. And uh, uh, so those are traditionals. Uh, Melomel is honey, water, yeast. It's traditional mead with fruit added. Okay. And from there, we go on to a thing called a methaglen. We don't have any right now, but uh, it is herbs or spices. So methaglen is Greek for medicine, herbs or spices. And there's uh, three other uh, options. There's a pimet, when you mix grape wine and mead together. There's a braggot, with beer makings and mead together, which is kind of a weird thing. It doesn't really, I've never seen one I like that. And then there's a, another one, it's called, uh, it's called a sizer, where we take, uh, basically, it's uh, apple juice, and we mix it with mead. Mix, it's called, instead of a cider, it's called a sizer. And it's quite nice. They can be really nice. Also. I have I made some, just a few of them, but not, not for sale. And so on. All right, so today, we're going to taste some of these. And the first one is King Arthur's Dry. Isn't it? Yeah, King Arthur's Dry is uh, number one. And it's one of those meads that you can drink with uh, chicken, turkey, whatever. It's, it's uh, drier on your tongue, but you still taste the honey, and that's part of the deal. If you don't taste honey in mead, well, why make it? Because you can make a lot of stuff. Some people make mead, and it's so dry, you wouldn't even know what it was. So I always try to keep the honey in and make it traditional. Anyway, have a sip. And, uh, just to let you know, when you smell something, smell is two-thirds of your taste. So it's very important to get that smell in there. And so you can taste it. And if you take three sips, the third sip will give you the real taste of what you're tasting. Thank you. Uh, showing you meat. We're making lip balm. It just oh. takes a little bit uh, of time to melt the shea butter and the bees wraps together. So I wanted to make sure we get it mixed properly um, while we were drinking. So these little recipe cards are for you to take home. As we talked about, there's lots of different products you can extract from the beehive. So it's not only for honey production. Originally, when bees were brought to North America from Europe, they were brought for their wax production, uh, for their use as uh, beeswax candles. Uh, because beeswax candles burn clean, they don't produce as much smoke and toxins, and they burn for longer than other types of candles. Or let's say like an oil lantern before the age of electricity. So it wasn't actually honey that they brought these over for, it was for the wax. Oh, so, really? Yeah. So wax is really for salves, for your like dry cracked heels. You can make a really nice um, sting cream, bee sting cream, uh, that's very similar to this recipe. Um, and it's very easy. It's a very easy product to use, and it has all sorts of different uses. Um, as well as the wax and the honey, you can make mead, you can make flavored honeys, whichever. You can harvest pollen as a beekeeper or propolis as a beekeeper. Um, and you can sell all of those products, right? Wow. So there's uh, so many different things you can do with the products the bees make. You can even sell the bee venom if you want to, as bee venom is really great for treating arthritis. Um, and you can actually that, that's what they were saying. Do you just poke that in a certain area? or You can. So you can buy bees and then sting whatever area is affecting you. 
or you can buy like a, an ointment where the uh, venom has been extracted and it, it's like a cream. So Archie used to, before he retired, <laughs> he used to work in the airlines. He was a pilot. So by the time he retired, he had really bad arthritis in his hips. And since becoming a beekeeper and getting stung, it, 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 went, it disappeared. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he has no issues now. And now, the question with that, because uh, technically the Philippines, there's lots of people with arthritis. I don't know why. <laughs> but um, do you, how often do you um, get them stung or whatever? You don't want to do it too often. So um, once a week would be okay, or no, once I would a say month? like once every couple months. Months, okay. Yeah, because you don't want your body to um, create like uh, anaphylaxis towards it, especially if you're using like sting treatment. Because mm -hmm. if you get, some doctors say that if you get stung repeatedly over the course of time, you develop an allergy to it, and you can. Oh, okay. I haven't found that personally, but yeah. yeah. That's interesting. But like also you don't want to be swollen. Like it hurts. I don't lie. Like these things mm -hmm. are itchy and swollen and sore. So you don't want to do that very frequently. But you want just that blood flow to that region, right? Alright, that was uh, one fun day. Uh, I learned a lot about beekeeping and what and uh, look, I got my own certificate and I got some lip balm recipe and uh, I even made my own lip balm. Where is it? Yeah, got one right here. So um, this would be really good and additional knowledge for my for me as going homestead and going farming in the Philippines and what and uh, yeah it's just a lot of knowledge that I learned from this and uh, hopefully I could apply it in the Philippines and again I need to still learn more in this kind of stuff because it, as the as Jocelyn said the instructor it's getting your hands in there to learn more and what but always be open to other knowledge that people has with experience and um, you know um, technically they're being doing this stuff for a very long time so I'm gonna get the knowledge of the locals in the Philippines of beekeepers there I'm gonna get my own nukes and what and uh, yeah uh, just experiment and you know have the most experience in this kind of stuff but anyway thank you guys very much for tagging along with this kind of vlog and what Hopefully it was interesting to you guys and uh, hopefully you guys stick some more, uh, stick there. Hopefully you guys stick beside me and uh, go with this journey of mine on doing farming and homestead and what in the Philippines, alright? And yeah, uh, thank you guys. Have a nice day. Again, be productive but don't forget to live. Deuce.